Hey everybody, Pastor Greg here. I'm excited about life and I know that you are too because life is good and it keeps getting better all the time. It is the month of June, which means our summer hours have begun. And so if you want to come and visit us, if you want to come and celebrate with us, you got to know what time to get here. Doors open at 10 a.m. and we begin our services promptly at 1030 a.m. That means you get out early and you can go to the beach, you can go out, you can have a good time and enjoy the sunshine. Because it is summer, that also means that I want you to save the date for our family and friends day, summer loving. It is going to be on the third Sunday, July 15th. You don't want to miss it. It is always packed. It is always jammed. But not only that, after service, we have food, fun, and music. Uh, we have wonderful things planned for the children as well. Save the date. We want to see you here no matter where you are all around the country. Get, book your plane ticket now and plan to be here with us at CSC. It's going to be awesome. It is the month of June, which means we have a new message series. Let's get into today's message. <laughs> well, good morning, Celebration Spiritual Center. Hello and welcome. So good to be here with you all. It's amazing. We take a week off. It feels like it's been way too long. So it's so good to see you all. Uh, we had a wonderful time in Detroit. Thank you all for, for those that were able to stream in live and, and support. Uh, we had a wonder, wonderful time and um, spent the last three days with Al Gore and the uh, Climate Reality Project uh, doing some powerful training uh, ministry and climate change. And so we're going to be bringing some awesome things to, to CSC as we continue to be the light of the world uh, through the lens of uh, loving our mother, loving our earth, and loving our planet. So I want to dig right in because we have a few things to talk about. And first, I want to give you some information. When we do this Reimagine the Bible series, it's always important. We started um, when we, I think we started this about two years ago. We started, first we focused on the Old or First Testament, and I gave you some, some information that I think is important to understand how to even look at the Bible from a different perspective. And then we did the Second Testament or the New Testament, and we, um, I'm going to echo some, some of that, uh, some of the history and some of the sort of scholarly teaching there. Um, let's see, we also did the book of Psalms, and so I thought it was fitting that we, in talking about the Bible, talk about what was not canonized in Scripture because it's important. And so we're focusing on the Gnostic Gospels this, this month. Now, as you, well, actually, before I get into that, let me first give you some book recommendations, and we'll, we'll also, uh, uh, I'll create a blog post with these links. The Nag Hammadi Scriptures great text, um, particularly that uh, text that is edited by Marvin Mayer and James Robins Robeson, actually. Um, you want that text, okay? Then we have the Gnostic Gospels by Elaine Pagels, very important, powerful scholar. Uh, her work is, is really the seminal work when we start to look at the Gnostic, Gnostic Gospels. And then two other texts, the Jesus Mysteries, and Jesus and the Lost Goddess, both by Tim Freak and Peter Gandy. Um, what they do is really synthesize the heart of Gnostic teachings and, and really help us to understand it from a holistic standpoint, understanding that Gnosticism is not limited to Christianity, it's not limited to uh, Judaism, it's not limited to Islam, right? And so actually across the mystical traditions, or the, I should say there is a mystical tradition within every spiritual tradition, right? And so this is really, uh, as we're looking at the lens of the Gnostic Gospels or the Gnostic Christians, we find these truths echoed all throughout time and all throughout many different cultures and spiritual expressions. So, as we shared in the synopsis for this series, for over 1,500 years, over 1,500, 1,500 to 1,600 years, the only source for understanding the teachings of Jesus was the four Gospels, the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then that changed. The first thing that happened is in 1896, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene showed up. Now, that's already powerful because, one, it wasn't considered that Mary Magdalene was even a disciple. She was considered to be one of the women on the fringes. But there's a gospel named after her. And, of course, the idea was that each of these gospels are, it was believed, written by the men that walked with Jesus. 
But even as we know, they weren't actually written by those men. They were written in the name of the disciples that walked with Jesus. And so if there's a gospel written in the name of Mary Magdalene, that upsets the apple cart. Yes, yes. <laughs> but then something even more powerful happened in 1945. The Nag Hammadi Library was discovered in Upper Egypt in the city of Nag Hammadi. And there were about 50 texts that were discovered, 30 of which were completely unknown until 1945. And so we recognize that, you know, and I'm sure many of you have heard it um, through, throughout your lives, this idea that, oh, there are lost books of the Bible or there are books that weren't included in the Bible. Well, at the time that the Bible was canonized, as we understand, the, whether we're looking at the Catholic Bible or even the Protestant Bible, at the time that that scripture was canonized, it was believed that those texts had been burned, destroyed. Because we recognize that the story of lost books and the story that there's certain books that aren't in the Bible have everything to do with who won and have nothing to do with the truth, right? It's, just, it's the same thing that, that, unfortunately, those of us here in the United States have experienced um, with the history that we read, right? We read about the expansion into the West like it was just a beautiful time and it was wonderful because people were able to live in new places and, and set their feet down. But, but that's not what happened. People who had been on that land for centuries were decimated, killed, disease was brought, raped, and pillaged. Right? Agreements and treaties were made and then violated. That's what happened. But that's not the story that we're told. Right? We're not told that most of, you know, present day, well, all of Texas, present day California, and most of the Southwest is Mexico. And so similarly, we have this same thing that happened as it relates to the canonized scripture. Another thing that happened, and this is important for one reason, in 1946 and 1947, the Dead Sea Scrolls emerged. Now, what's important about this is that the Dead Sea Scrolls gave us another lens on Judaism. But the reason why that's even important as it relates to the Gnostic Gospels is because the Dead Sea Scrolls were found at the Qumran Cave, which was from the community called the Essenes, which was the mystical Jewish tradition. And we know that Jesus and John the Baptist grew up in that community, in that tradition. So if we want to understand how they got to their ministry, how they got to their teachings, how they got to their perspective, it's important that we read the text that they were reading. So that's where the Dead Sea Scrolls are important. But the earth is still giving us beautiful gifts because in the 1970s, 1978, the gospel of Judas emerged. Wait, the man who betrayed Jesus has a gospel written in his name? And so just recently, the gospel of Judas was, was published in 2006. And so it's very interesting to me that the earth in the mid 20th century began to reveal these texts suggests that humanity was ready for this truth or needed these truths to take us into this century and beyond. Now, one of the things, the emergence of these texts, what they show us is that there was always a diversity of thought within early Christianity. There wasn't one way of seeing, one way of being, and these texts prove that. Now, because these texts didn't exist, all we had were the words of the church fathers or bishops like um, Irenaeus, who basically said that all of these texts are heretical, they're false, and they're illegitimate. So the first thing that happened when, when scholars first um, started to receive these texts, they thought that they were just going to read heretical foolishness, because this is what they had been hearing all along. So they translated the text. And they expected foolishness, and that's not what they found. One of the first texts that, that we have that uh, we could begin to study in 1959 was the Gospel of Thomas. And what's interesting is, again, as they read the Gospel of Thomas and they were looking for foolishness, they were looking for heresy, they were looking for something that was illegitimate, they couldn't find it. And one writer says this, that the scholars then believed and, and said this, that this just goes to show how devious heretics are, that they don't say what they really mean. So we're not finding heresy in it, and, but that's just how devious they are because they're wolves in sheep's clothing, right? But thankfully, as scholarship continued, 
scholars began to look at the text from a different place. One of the things that we know in the Gospel of Thomas is so beautiful is that it's not a narrative. So in the first four Gospels or the, pre the previous Gospels, right, we have a story. We get uh, in some Gospels the story of Jesus' birth, and then it takes us through this journey to his death, resurrection, and ascension, right? That's not what we get in the Gospel of Thomas. The Gospel of Thomas reminds me of Vedic scripture in some ways because it's literally just sayings. Each verse is a saying. It's just like a truth bomb. And the idea, as Jesus is speaking to the disciples, he's not even interpreting his, wor his words. The underlying idea or the overarching idea behind this text is that if you read this and digest it and process it on your own, that will lead to your awakening. That will lead to your enlightenment. That will lead to your salvation. Now, the other thing that's interesting, and I, I talked about this when we talked about the New Testament, is that there's a theory about the New Testament. Uh, it's believed or was believed that Mark was the earliest gospel. So we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And what we find is that there are things that are in Matthew and Luke that aren't in Mark. But we also recognize that there are things that are in Mark that are in Matthew and Luke. And so there's a theory called the Q theory or the source theory. Q stands for quell. It's the German word, which means source. And so what, what, what was believed and what's posited is that there must be a book of sayings not a narrative, but a book of sayings that they pulled from, that Matthew and Mark, I mean, Matthew and Luke pulled from, along with pulling from Mark. And the reason why they believe they had to pull from Mark, because Mark is the oldest text. So they had this older text that they got some information from, but there's another text called Q that we, it doesn't exist. We don't know where it is, but by looking through the text, we can see there was something in common that they pulled from. Well, guess what? Mark being the oldest text was believed to be written 40 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. But we now know that the Gospel of Thomas is the oldest text. It's so recent that it was actually believed to have been written about 20 years after the death of Jesus. Which is, is heart, heartwarming to me because uh, it means that we're getting as close as possible to what the historical Jesus might have said. And so if that's true, then I think it's important that we look at this text. But what's even more interesting is when we read what this Jesus is saying, we hear life a little different. We see ourselves different, differently, and we move through the earth differently. So one of the first things, and this is one of my favorite um, sayings within this text uh, right begins near the beginning, and it says, Jesus said, let one who seeks not stop seeking until one finds. And when one finds, one will be troubled. When one is troubled, one will marvel and will reign over all. And some translations then add this, and having reigned, one will rest. And so as we recognize that the path to gnosis, and this is what the Gnostics are talking about, this path to knowledge, to knowing, and the path to Sophia, wisdom, which is always feminine, comes through this thing that Jesus just said. Let one who seeks, we seek and we persist in our seeking until we find and we will find. But what happens when we find? We become troubled. Other translations say you become disturbed. I add you'll become confused <laughs> or sometimes scared. But it says after you move through that process, then you will marvel. It made me think about, uh, even as I, I, I was reflecting on my notes this morning, Marvel, right? We, we, Y'all know I love Marvel movies, right? The cinematic universe. So it's like saying, then you become a superhero. Right? <laughs> and the text, I'm, I'm not inserting in the text, because what does it say? Then you will reign over all, which is the mastery of life. And having reign, one will rest. And so what it began, I, th I thought about the path. I don't, everyone, we all have a different journey of what brought us to this path, this new thought path or this spiritual path. And where it starts is a seeking. Where it starts is that thing that, that Morpheus calls in the Matrix to, he says to Neo, that splinter in your mind. You just can't let go. There's just something that doesn't seem right. Everything doesn't really add up. I, I don't believe I'm going to hell and I don't even believe that hell is real. 
And actually, if I do a little bit of reading, I can see that that's true. Well, I, I don't believe that I'm sinful. I, I don't believe that if, if the scripture says that God's mercy, loving kindness endureth forever, how can mercy endure forever, ever, but this thing send us into eternal punishment? It doesn't, it doesn't add up. Doesn't make sense. Let one seek and continue to seeking until she or he finds. But when we find, we become troubled. Now, initially, it, it seems good. It feels good. But then when we get to this idea of our thoughts create our reality. And then we got some things to wrestle with there. Wait, hold, hold, hold up, Pastor Greg. Are you saying I created my job loss? That's troubling. That's disturbing. What are, you, what are you saying, Pastor Greg? Are you saying that someone that is raped created that, Pastor Greg? Is that what you're saying? We become troubled. We become disturbed. We become confused because we've been introduced to this truth. But then we recognize that we have to actually then delve into the layers of what this truth really means. One, that most of us are not consciously choosing the negative things that show up in our lives. And then also we get to this understanding that the universe only knows yes. Scripture says the things of God are yes and amen. And so we actually don't live in a reality where God, uh, even as the Greek gods are portrayed in this way as well, like that they test us or they move the chess pieces um, against us or in front of us. That's not actually what's going on. So it's not even God that's punishing us, but it's, it's our, generally speaking, our unknown consciousness, things that have been implanted in our minds that we didn't even realize that the world is a scary place, that the world is not friendly, that, that uh, you know, one day the bottom will drop out. And so then that belief then outpictures and plays out in a number of different ways, which has, we, you know, we look into the, the different minutia of our life and our experiences and what we expect or what we may have seen or what we've absorbed from TV or what we've absorbed from movies. And then we begin to understand what's going on. But then we also recognize that then the same mind that unknowingly attracted the unwanted is the same mind that can now knowingly and deliberately change that situation and attract what is good because we recognize that it is all energy. Energy cannot be created or destroyed, but transmuted. And when we get to that place, then we can move into this place of marvel and this place of reigning, because now we get to live as deliberate creators. Now we know the process. Now we know we can bring forth any good. You get a business idea and you know the inner work that's required in order to bring that business forward easily and effortlessly. You decide that you want to purchase a new home. Well, you recognize there's external things that you want to do. But as I said last week in my message, it's not mind over matter. It's mind before matter. So you get your mind right. You do that inner work. And then the matter, this external world, will reflect that. And of course, as we recognize then that this path of seeking, finding, being troubled, and then marveling, reigning, and resting, it's not a process that ends. Even once you get to this place of mastery, it doesn't mean that unwanted things don't show up. It doesn't mean that, that you won't uh, be sad at the transition of a loved one. It doesn't mean that, that um, things may not look the way you want to look. It doesn't mean that the president in the White House is not somebody you don't want in there. Like Things are still going to happen. But what's beautiful and, and the, the wisdom that Jesus is showing us here is that when you understand this process then you know how to shift and change the energy. You now have this awareness that from this marvel place, from this reigning place, you now know that you can shift and change and transmute this energy in any way you, you see fit. No longer are you going to move back to the troubled, disturbed place, although that happens for all of us sometimes. But you know how to get back there. So then we move a little deeper into the text and I love something that Jesus writes or says here. He didn't write it. <laughs> we move further down, and I believe this is the fifth, fifth saying. Jesus said, know what is in front of your face, and what is hidden from you will be disclosed to you. For there is nothing hidden that will not be revealed. I want to read that again. 
Know what is in front of your face, and what is hidden from you will, will be disclosed to you. For there is nothing hidden that will not be revealed. And there's some, there's some juicy goodness in here. Now, the first thing is, as we just talked about how these texts came into being, that there would be nothing hidden from us, that there were 15 to 1,600 years of spiritual darkness, if you will, right, of, of spiritual ignorance, if you will, that's probably a better word, where we didn't have these deeper truths, and we had a very narrow perspective or understanding of what Jesus was all about and what the people that followed Jesus were all about and the, the expressions of Christianity that were given birth after, uh, after he left the scene. And so we recognize that the wisdom here, even at that time, he's saying that don't, don't fret or don't, be, don't lament over this idea of they're not telling the whole truth or they're keeping something away from us. Because he says, know what is in front of your face and what is hidden from you will be disclosed. But then he says, for there is nothing hidden that will not be revealed. And so the earth at the right time in the right place in the right way gave birth to these texts, the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Nag Hammadi Library. But then there's another idea that I love that's in this first part. Know what is in front of your face and what is hidden from you will be disclosed to you. We say it this way now, life is a mirror. If you want to know what, what's going on in your consciousness, what you're really thinking, look at, in the mirror, look at life. When you can look at your life and you see like, oh, wow, it's just everything is good. Things are just flowing. I feel in the flow. And everywhere I go, uh, I'm met with the right people in the right places or the right opportunities. The money always shows up. That's a reflection of your consciousness. Know what is in front of your face and what is hidden from you will be disclosed so that you can't get inside your brain and examine your consciousness. But you can look at the mirror of your life and you begin to see that. So similarly, when you're triggered by something, any number of things that our present president is saying. <laughs> know what is in front of your face. Look at what he's saying. And if you're triggered by it, what is hidden from you will be disclosed. There's something, some work that needs to be done. Now, I love to talk about um, my good friends, uh, Carl and Kenya Stevens. I love how they teach about the mirror. because, And, and this for me was, I, I love, they kind of took it to a, a, another level and, and I, I believe this will be beneficial to all of us. There's three ways we can look at the mirror because generally speaking, we talk about it, right? If I'm triggered by what somebody said or didn't say or what they did or did not do, that's really about me. It has nothing to do with them because I've placed a meaning on their action. And so I get to see what I really believe about life, right? But there's three ways we can look at it. And so let's think about a mirror with three panes. The center is our potentials. And what does that mean? If you go to a concert or you see people back in the day, they would go to the Michael Jackson concert and faint. <laughs> they were overwhelmed by their potential. In that moment, they were seeing what genius looks like and the genius within them was being mirrored back. That's our potentials. And so if you see people in your life or you walk into a room and, and everybody is you know, amazing and brilliant and credentialed, you're seeing your mirror. You're seeing your potential. You could not walk into a room of amazing people like you are in this room right now, except you also be great and amazing. Look in the mirror. Know what is in front of your face and what is hidden from you will be disclosed. Your greatness is being disclosed. Your, your power is being demonstrated. Your worthiness is being demonstrated. Look in the mirror. Know what is in front of your face. That's your potential. But then if we go to the right side of the mirror, we're looking at our patterns or our programs. We talked a lot about it last, last month as we were using You Are the Placebo and Dr. Joe Dispenza that this is that 95% of our brain, the unconscious part, that's full of patterns and programs, full of expectations. And we don't know what's really going on in there until we see it, until we can look in the mirror and see it. And so this is that part where we get triggered, right? This is that, that, that part where we, may, we did, may not realize it or we may have an expectation about 
all blank people are like this. All men are this way. All women are this way. All short people are this way. All tall people are this way. Whatever it may be. Or there's a recognition of people that look like me don't get certain opportunities. We're always overlooked. They're always putting us last, right? And so then if every experience in your life you find yourself being put last, know what is in front of your face and what is hidden from you will be disclosed. What's being disclosed is this, this thought process, this program of unworthiness, this program that you're last or you think you're last or you believe that you were last or you were told that you were last. Uh, even as we go back to, to Joe Dispenza, um, he shares some of the studies. Um, interesting um, in terms of test taking that they took, uh, they, they used uh, different populations. They, they took women um, and took one group and said, uh, all w women are amazing in science and math, and more amazing than men. And the women that they were given, given that idea scored higher on the test than the women that were told that women don't do well in math. They did the same thing with young African-American kids. This is why we have to speak to our babies. This is why we have to speak truth into them and remind them that they're powerful, remind them that they're capable, remind them that they're worthy, remind them that they're intelligent. Because we're helping to develop those patterns. We also talked about it last month, from zero to 12, children are the most suggestible. So those, that's the time when we need to get those patterns in. I am so thankful and grateful. I know why I live the life that I live, because I know the things that were spoken to me as a child. And so know what is in front of your face and what is hidden from you will be disclosed to you. So if you've received that, that suggestion, and unfortunately many people have, didn't have teachers that saw the truth of them, didn't have teachers that affirmed them, or didn't have elders that affirmed them. And so if you see in your life there's this constant pattern of failing or it just seems like things aren't working out for me, what that's showing, to, showing us or what that's showing you potentially is this pattern or program that you have the ability to shift and change. And then finally, we have our proclivities. I love this one. And this, this one is important because if we're going to marvel and if we're going to reign over all, then we have to be clear about this. Our proclivities, it goes like this. Pastor Yolanda and I are having a conversation. And I'm, I'm make this is hypothetical, y'all. <laughs> We're having a conversation, and um, I'm asking her a question, and she's texting on her phone. Now, I'm using this because this is something I do, right? She doesn't do this. And I want her attention. And she's texting. I'm, and I'm, you know, I'm watching her and I'm talking. I'm like, oh, she's just not going to look up at me. What happens? Maybe it's just me. Yeah, would y'all get annoyed a little bit? Like, like, she's not paying attention to me. But the proclivity is, if I'm getting annoyed, why am I getting annoyed? Because I already said it. You do the same damn thing, brother. <laughs> so many times, as we're getting triggered by someone and someone's actions... What we're actually seeing is what we do. We're getting the mirror to see what it looks like to be unloving when you don't look up at, at, at someone that's trying to have a conversation with you. We get to see what it looks like when we're not kind, right? We, we get to see what it looks like when we ignore someone. We get, get to see what it looks This is why it doesn't feel good, thank God, for Donald Trump. This is why he does not feel good to us. Because we're getting to see at the depths of our being what it looks like when we act that way. And so then the message is change. Know what is in front of your face. 45 is in the White House in front of our face. And what is hidden from us is being disclosed. The consciousness of humanity in this country and really on the planet is being disclosed to us. And he's mirroring it to us proudly and boldly. God through him is saying, wake up. <laughs> God through him is saying, this is what it looks like when you continue to ignore truth, when you continue to ignore love, when you continue to ignore the fact that we are unified, that we're one people. This is what it looks like in any way when, uh, when, when we other someone else or we live in a place of separation. We can get upset about the things that, that our president is saying about immigrants, but we also have to acknowledge the times in our lives, at any point in our lives, when we've lived in that place of othering or separation. 
whether it was people that looked like us or, or did not look like us. And so then the opportunity is to heal it within ourselves because the hermetic axiom is clear, as within, so without. And so when we forgive ourselves first and set ourselves free, for any time that we may have lived in a place of separation or othering or, or lived in a place of generalities and, and, and putting a group of people or putting a gender in a box or putting children in a box or putting our elderly in a box, we forgive ourselves and we set ourselves free. Because we realize it doesn't feel good. It doesn't, it, it doesn't look good. And if it pisses us off and we can see it, that means we have work to do. And so I want to leave you with this. We have a wonderful outdoor space here in New York City called Bryant Park. Named after a gentleman, William Cullen Bryant. And we know he was quoted by Dr. Martin Luther King where he says, William Cullen Bryant is right. Truth crushed to earth will rise again. And so that is echoing these words from Jesus, for there is nothing hidden that will not be revealed. And so when we understand this from this wisdom text, from this ancient text that, that is being echoed across centuries, actually across millennia, then we recognize we can look at the times and see what's going on. We can interpret the times that we're living. Nothing hidden, there is nothing hidden that will not be revealed. So when we look at the Me Too movement, when we look at Time's Up, we see what's really going on. Jesus said it thousands of years ago. Truth crushed to earth will rise again, Weinstein. Truth crushed to earth will rise again, Cosby. Truth crushed to earth will rise again, brothers. And so it's time for us to get our house in order collectively because it's showing up. The school shootings, I believe, and I, I was having a discussion with, with someone about this the other week, it's a symptom of the disease and cancer that is existent within this country. There is nothing hidden that will, be, that will not be revealed. We can hide behind the NRA. We can even hide behind the, the glories of hunting, right? I'm not, I'm not speaking against anybody that chooses to hunt. But I recognize that behind that, we're not willing to have, many are not willing to have the real discussions that we need to have about guns and gun violence and even how guns have been used from the, almost the inception of this country, but how specifically the guns were um, em embraced and actually the first Smith and Wesson was created at the same time that the KKK was created. And so we, we have to understand, we have to look at that, right? And there's things that we need to heal. I believe in my heart of hearts that there will be truth and reconciliation. It will happen in this country. But we have to pay attention to this. I even believe and recognize as, we, and I, as I was sitting in, in uh, the climate change summit this, this past few days, that when we look at the extreme weather patterns and we look at climate, what we're seeing is, again, the as within, so without. We're seeing really our own consciousness being mirrored out and played out on our planet and on our earth, right? It's a dis-ease that needs to change. Even as we consider, uh, you know, our, our rivers, many of our, our rivers are uninhabitable. Many of our rivers are blocked and clogged and junk are in our rivers. Well, your veins, your artery system is a river. Many of our rivers are clogged and, and blocked. As within... <laughs> So without, nothing hit, there is nothing hidden that will not be revealed, that will not be disclosed. And so, no, you may not be able to look inside of your veins and see what's going on. But if you look at what's happening on Mother Earth, she's showing us what's happening within ourselves. So my encouragement to you is to know what is in front of your face. As we recognize that each of us have work to do, because the only person that we can change is ourselves. Yes, yes? Because if we could change, you know, Donald Trump, we would have all collectively changed him. We would have beamed change to him immediately. But can you change yourself? Can you change your habits? Can you change your actions? Can you change your behaviors? Yes, yes, we can. 
And so then this is where the beautiful axiom, it's a part of the consciousness of new thought that was written at a time that peace didn't exist and it was written at a time that even in new thought there was separation and segregation. Let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. Know what's in front of your face. Whatever is right there in front of your face right now is your work. And then the echo Byron, Byron Katie, then that keeps us in our business. Yes, yes? So with that, I invite everybody to stand. We take a deep breath in and we release. We take a deep breath in and we release. Mother, Father, God, we are so grateful and thankful in this moment for the mirror, this gift, this grace that has been given to us that we get to see what we are thinking onto the canvas of life. We get to see what we are projecting on the screen of life, not to call us bad, not to move us into a place of shame, not to move us into a guilty place, but to call us to change, to call us softly through a whisper, through the still small voice, to see life differently, to think life differently, to approach life differently. We are so grateful and thankful that there is a process, as was echoed by this great master teacher, that if we know what is in front of our face, we can actually achieve mastery. That's what the seeking and continuing to seek process is all about. And when we know what is in front of our face, as we are seeking first, we will be troubled. Oh, Lord, that's me? First, we will be disturbed. Oh, no, that's what I was thinking? First, we will be confused or scared. Oh, no, I was living in a place of lack and, and unworthiness. But then we will marvel because we recognize that this process is a process that allows us to shift and change. We will marvel as we recognize that we can implant new ideas into our consciousness. We will marvel and reign over all, all of our life, not over any person or any being. And we will rest because no longer are we worried about how we can live a prosperous life. No longer are we worried about how we can live the life that we've imagined. No longer are we worried about how we can live our greatest lives. For we recognize that we only need to know what is in front of our face. I'm reminded of the words of Dr. Martin Luther King where he says, faith is simply taking the first step, not knowing or seeing the entire path or the entire journey. Know what is in front of your face and then all else will be revealed to you. Take the first step. Take the first step. Take the first step. What is in front of your face? Get out of the future. Somebody needs to hear that today. Get out of the future and know what is in front of your face. Then everything will be revealed to you. The rest of the plan will be revealed to you. The next step will be revealed to you. The people that you need to incorporate into that idea will be revealed to you. How much money you really need to bring that forth will be revealed to you. But if you're living in the future or living in the past, you are not looking at what is in front of your face. Be here now. 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 Know what is in front of your face. We are so grateful for the wisdom that comes through this master teacher that speaks to us now in 2018. We are so grateful and thankful that these texts are available to us now to open up our hearts and minds into a greater awakening, into a greater understanding, into a greater loving, into a greater knowing. For this truth, I am so very grateful. I release this prayer with joy and thanksgiving. And together we say amen. amen. Ashe. Ashe. And so it is. So it is. So it is. Thank you.